day you've made. So I'll rejoice and be glad, rejoice and be glad in it. And this is where I believe that you are
saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolled in stone.
storm surrounding me let it break at your name still you call the sea to still the rage in me to still every way at your name Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus, you silence me. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. So I was thinking, as I'm standing here worshiping, and we begin this song, I'm thinking, what, you know, what makes the enemy afraid? What makes the enemy, we all want to push the enemy from our life, right? Like we, don't, we don't want his plans to succeed. And, and uh, so there's two things that just jumped into my spirit right away. The first is obviously the name of Jesus, right? Jesus, Jesus makes the enemy flee. We all know that, right? Praise God, praise God. But then there's another part of it too. It's the part that we play um, because we do play a part in this whole thing. And what we bring to the table is faith, faith, a coming to Jesus. You have to bring both of those together. If you want the enemy to be cast out of your life, the fact that Jesus came and died and rose again and rules at the right hand of the Father, all that stuff has happened. It's all been done. It's all enough to cause the enemy to flee from your life. But if you don't step into that space and say, absolutely, I believe it. I'm standing on it. I'm not running away. I'm running to Jesus like that. If you don't bring that faith, then I kind of feel like the enemy has his way. So this morning, we're, we're going to sing this song and Throughout the whole thing, we're gonna declare how the name of Jesus and all this, and it's gonna be wonderful. But what I want you to do is I wanna make sure that while you're singing, you're not just singing words on a screen, okay? Because that doesn't change anything for your life. I say this all the time, this is not Christian karaoke, okay? That's not what we're doing here right now. This is a powerful spiritual thing. While you're singing the words, you have to pair that with your own personal faith, connect it to your faith, to your life. You think about the things that are in you that need to be submitted to him. The places the enemy is having some victory, you think about them, you bring them to Jesus. You say, I'm declaring your victory over this area. I'm standing in faith. And as we do that, we have promises in God's word that the enemy has to flee. 
He has to flee. He has no choice. He has no dominion. He has no authority over you. But you got to do your part. And another beautiful thing is, hey, it's wonderful. We're not in this room by ourselves, are we? <laughs> Praise God. Look at all these wonderful people, believers in Christ that surround you. That means you don't have to stand alone. Sometimes we can feel a little bit weak. If it's left up to us to get the sword out and go, we're like, I just don't have it, you know. And that's when you need somebody to come alongside and to lift you up. So I think this is a perfect moment for it. As we begin to sing the song, if you feel like you need a little strength, a little prayer support from somebody else, you know, we have a prayer team. We have people that it's their ministry to pray, to intercede. Let them come alongside you. Step on into an aisle, come forward, whatever you need to do. Just, just give the Lord that opportunity. And uh, I know he's going to do great things. Let me pray over you real quick. Jesus, would you anoint the next few moments that we have? These worship times are precious. Lord, we want to get all that we can out of it, and we want to give you all that we can because you deserve it. So, Lord, in the next few minutes, extend our faith beyond the borders that it has been held to. Lord, let, let the tent posts be ex extended and stretched even further, Lord. I pray that you would do more in the next few minutes, Lord, than we've been able to accomplish an entire lifetime. Set people free, bring healing, do miracles, Lord, in relationships and finances and health and every arena of our life, we're bringing it to you. Lord, it's not the power of positive thinking. We're standing on faith in Jesus Christ, the risen King. The tomb is empty. The throne in heaven is filled. It is you, Christ. We stand in you. We declare, Jesus, you are Lord of all. You are Lord of these areas of our life. You are Lord, ruler, dominant, victorious over every single one. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
prompting of the Lord that we would stand in the gap and intercede as a church right now for, for wayward children. Right now, children that have, have perhaps known the love of Christ and have walked away. And there are hearts that are broken in this room right now. Because you fear for your soul of your children and it weighs on you. And the Lord knows the pain that you're going through. And he feels that too. And he wants to begin to break that free and he wants to begin to break that hold that the enemy has on your child's mind, the way that they think. And so right now, would, can we just lift our hands around this room right now just in a surrender of faith. Lord, we stand in the gap and we intercede as a body right now. For children represented by loved ones in this place, family members that have walked away from you, Lord, we stand right now and we say, enemy, you have no authority. Though they have given their mind and their heart towards the enemy, Jesus, we stand right now and we say, Lord, would you take them back? Stretch your hand into the fire and, and pull them back out. Lord, you know how to do it. You know exactly the interactions that need to take place for these individuals, Lord, that will wake them up. Words that need to be spoken, things that they have hurting in their heart that need to be healed. You see them, Jesus, and I pray right now for each of these wayward children, Lord, that you would Bring them, bring them to the grace, bring them to the mercy seat of Christ, bring them back into truth. We pray against the hold of the enemy. I pray that it would be broken in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we speak it. This isn't, this isn't us. We can't do it. We confess it, Lord. We are powerless. All of our words, they, they amount to nothing. We try and it just not, nothing happens. It is in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, you're the one who has to do the work. So we're just, we're just casting it to you. Let it be done. And we speak it in faith. Amen. Amen. We got one more song to sing. Let's sing one more, church. Hallelujah.
Jesus, the work that you have begun at these altars this morning, Father, let it be a spark. Birth a new fire and a new passion within us. Let us not become distracted by our circumstances, distracted by the things that might be going on around us. Jesus, we choose to focus on you and you alone. You are greater, you are above it all, you are holy and you are worthy. So Jesus, this morning we give you all the praise and all the glory for what you're doing. It is in your holy and powerful name we pray this morning, amen. Amen, church, isn't God so good? He is so good. We're excited to have you with us this morning here at Connection Church. Why don't you take a few minutes and say hello to some people around you today. All right, all right. 
head on back to your seats if you would be so kind, as we have more stuff to do. Did you guys have a good weekend, good week, everything going well? Hopefully. Some of you may be more than others, but that's all right. Okay. You guys got a bulletin on your way in. We always like to take a minute to draw your attention to some things as if you can't read, but I don't know why we do this, but we do it every week. And yeah, we got women's ministry coming up on the, on the 14th. I guess that's Thursday. Well, that's not right. All right, well, the thing says Tuesday in the thing and then Thursday over, it's Thursday, if you're wondering. Women's ministry, Thursday. And uh, we got men, we're playing basketball that same Thursday, 6.30. Who's my basketball players? Anybody play ball, but you've never come out yet? Anybody? You've come out. You play ball? Come out. Man, you got to come. We need some more players. You got to show up. 6.30. Be here. It's going to be great. All right. Hey, and bowling too. That's next Sunday. I'm getting excited about it. I love this event. We do it every year. It's one of our annuals, and we have so much fun. Um, and I, as I tried to mention this last week, and I hope you're hearing me on this, if you're not good at bowling, please don't view this as like this is just for bowlers event. This is a church event. It's just to come and hang out. We use bowling as the excuse, okay? That's the way, and if you know, like if you come, you know. It's not all about bowling. It's just about connecting with each other. And a lot of people don't even bowl. They just show up and have a good time. So that's, that's next Sunday at 6 o'clock. Water baptisms are coming up with 24th. We got a couple people I know that are signed up. But if anybody else wants to, uh, please don't miss that. Because we tend to only do these. Uh, we do one in the spring, one in the fall. Uh, so it can be a long throw to get to the next one. Um, so yeah, if, if you want to be a part of that, Please sign up, even if you're just, you're just thinking about it. You're like, well, I'd like more information. Go ahead and sign up, and I'll try to follow up with you. And then Easter candy is also on here. We want to make, make sure Easter is a lot of fun for the kids. So the bin is now out in the lobby. Please be donating some of that. That will help. We have our, our dwell worship night on the 29th. We do that on Good Friday every year. We just feel like that's a great time just to come and worship the Lord uh, on Good Friday. So that will be at 7 o'clock. Don't miss that. Um, we are blessed with a, with a wonderful worship team. And so uh, that night is just, is just all about having time to spend with the Lord, and uh, you won't, you won't want to miss it. So sound good? Sound good? We know what's going on. Fantastic. Ushers are in place. This is our moment that we get to connect some of the practical of our life with what we just did, which is kind of like the spiritual stuff. We, we just spent all that time worshiping all the words, all the prayers, and that's wonderful. I love doing that. Um, but then... But then we also need to make sure that we're connecting it to the practical stuff of our life. And offering is a moment for that, where our worship actually extends to our resources. And uh, that's, man, that's huge. And I want to encourage you, if, you are, if you're faithfully giving, uh, continue. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Okay? God, God provides in wonderful ways. So continue on. If you have not yet experienced the joy of giving... Now, use that term intentionally because it's a joy. Amen, church? It's a joy. The more you give, you, the more you start to realize that. It's a privilege. It's a joy. If you haven't yet stepped into those waters, let me just encourage you. Um, test, your, test your God in that. He tells us that we can do that. Test him. Stretch your faith. Hey, start small if you need to. If that's the way it needs to go, start, wade into those waters and let the Lord begin to prove himself. Because I promise you, he will. He does every single time. And uh, as you do that, it's going to be a blessing, and not only to you, but it blesses the kingdom of God. It helps us as a church. It helps our God-sized vision. Ten percent of everything we give goes into outreach, both here for our church family, in our community, all the way around the world. You don't, you don't want to miss being a part of that. And so let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Lord, would you anoint what takes place right now? We know it's, a, it's an act of obedience and surrender when we part with our resources. And we need you to make up the difference, God. And we trust that you will. And Lord, as, as we give right now, we're also going to need you to multiply it. Because, uh, Lord, we can't give millions. It doesn't, doesn't tend to work that way for us, Lord. So we give uh, what is meager. But we know that you can come and you, and you take it and you breathe upon it. You bless it. And you use it to do such amazing things. So multiply it. And I pray you'd also help our missionaries all around the world. Help them, Lord, to have advancements in their ministry this week. Let them see salvations take place. 
conversations that have been building and moving towards you. I pray this week, God, that they would have those just divine moments to share the gospel and see, see response. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and uh, collect the offering. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Always such a blessing. This is, I believe this is our third week now in our series on on the heart of Christ. Uh, It's a six-week series. going to take us all the way up to Easter Sunday. At least that's the plan. And so uh, I've been enjoying it. It's been blessing me. Uh, If you have not yet got one of the books. We have books on that back table right back there. I think there's probably a good 50 or so left. And so uh, we have enough for anyone who wants one. Um, So so don't miss out. This is your first time with us as part of this series. We're providing those free of charge. And uh, during during this series, I'm pulling out some of the things because I read through it. And you know, like when you read a book, you like underline the stuff you really like and put brackets around it. So what I'm doing in this series, I'm just pulling some of those things out, talking them through. Um, and then adding some of my own thoughts in. But the way it goes, it's a, it, you know, it's a full-size book. So I'm only scratching the surface. There's a lot of other things uh, that Dane Ortland covers that would be a blessing to you. So uh, just maybe, maybe read part of a chapter every day when you're in your devotional time. Just read a couple pages. And that's going to bless your life. It's going to keep stretching you in this area. I'd, I'd encourage you. In other words, don't take a book and then just use it as the coaster uh, on your nightstand for your cup of water. Like that's not, that's not why we're giving them to you. We want you to take them and read them. Does that sound good? Sound good? Good. Me and Brian, we're on the same page. Like I, I see you, Brian. Brian's like, yes. Okay. Nobody else is with me, but it's going to be. It's going to be good. All right, so the last, uh, the last couple of weeks, we've just begun into this heart of Christ thing, talking about his heart for, for sinners and for sufferers. And as we walk through the struggles of life, that Jesus is right there with, with us. Amen? He's, he's with us. And we're going to really uh, kind of focus in on that more and more today. And it's great to be reminded that Jesus doesn't just love us when we're doing great, uh, but he also loves us when we're struggling. And when we, when we do have sin in our life, as much as he, he hates sin, he hates sin because he knows it's going to hurt us, right? He loves us, he hates the sin because he knows it's going to hurt us. And so when sin is in our life, he's doing everything he can through the, the movement of the Holy Spirit to draw that to the surface so we can get rid of it. That's what he wants for you. But, but it doesn't stop his love for you. And that's really the heart of what this series is all about, how much Jesus uh, loves you and and why he, why he came for you in the first place. It was to provide the cure for the disease. Who was here last week? Remember the doctor illustration? The doctor that went to that primitive tribe and he was there. He had the antidote to the disease. But hey, until the people come, until they step in and get the antidote or the antibiotic or whatever, it's not going to help anybody. And, and on top of the lack of help for the ones dying of the disease, it also prevents the joy of the doctor from being realized. Right? Because... W- that, that doctor would have joy as he hands out this, this, this uh, antibiotic. And Christ operates the same way for us. We're told about the joy that he has. Matter of fact, in Hebrews 12, 2, it said it was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. And we know what the cross is all about, the suffering that Jesus endured. And it just blows our mind to think that he would do that. But, but he did that except for the joy set before him, and that's us. That's us, that he loved us that much. We are his, we are his joy. And so uh, we've been through that and through some other things over the last couple of weeks. I do want to take us all the way back to Matthew 11, though, real quick um, and make sure that we read our theme verse for this particular series. And so uh, let me just read it to you real quick. Matthew 11, 28 through 30 says, uh, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and... And learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Those just, those couple sentences are so powerful because believe it or not, that point in scripture is the only spot in the gospels where Jesus says, this is my heart for you. Like from his own lips, he's saying, this is it. If you've ever wondered before, I need you to know my heart for you is gentle, it's lowly. And in the first week of the series, we really dived into what those mean. Um, But we're going to continue on this month uh, with some new things. You guys ready for new stuff today? Praise God. You got your Bibles with you? 
Let me see them. I'll always like to see who's got the Bible. Very good. If you don't have one, by the way, I have some extras because I'm a pastor, right? And that's what pa pastors got Bibles, you know? And so if you want a Bible uh, after church, like just come up and let me know. I I'll go grab one off the shelf. I'll just give one to you. It'd be a blessing to me uh, to be able to give that to you so that next week you can hold your Bible up uh, and that would be wonderful. So let's go ahead and give a nice, loud connection church shout for God's word as we turn to Hebrews chapter four. <laughs> Bless God, Hebrews four. <clears throat> we like to get excited for God's word. Because it is our pathway to life, isn't it? So we should get excited about it. Let's go to Hebrews 4. And I believe it's verse, verse 14. Uh, we're going to look at three verses for the bulk of today. And this is, uh, this is powerful stuff. Matter of fact, we just covered these verses in our, in our men's Bible study. Hey, do you guys know we study, study the Bible on Wednesday nights here? I know we don't talk about it a whole lot. Um, so I'll just do a little side promo. But we, we have Bible studies Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, Pam Kitzmiller leads one in the, very, the, the back of the church. She's got a mixed gender group. where man, She does a great job just rightly dividing the word of truth and sharing it. I would encourage you to be a part of that. Um, and then my wife up in the loft, she does a group just for, uh, for women. Wonderful job. They dive deep into the word. They pray for each other. It's a, it's a really good group. Um, and then I meet with some guys in my prayer room, which is next to my office over there. And we just, and we, we talked through the word. And it was just last week. I think it was last week. We covered this portion of scripture, um, which was so, it was encouraging. Here's what I've learned. You don't have to be a pastor, a Bible scholar, or a theologian to study God's word and talk about it. Anybody can do it. Anybody can. Like you, you, might, you might feel like, I don't even know what it says half the time. Like every time I try to read my Bible, I'm just confused. That's all right. Matter of fact, come to a Bible study. That's the best place you can be. Some of the best Bible studies I have ever been a part of are with people who don't really know what in the world's going on because they have the best questions. The best questions. Like they see things in ways that other people don't. And they ask this question like, that is so good. And then everybody gets to talk about it and everybody gets built up together. That's the beauty of doing these things. So if, yeah, if you're not participating... Wednesday night, 7, just jump into one. But let's go ahead. You guys, that was a long promo. That was random. All right, let's, let's get down to it. Here we go. In Hebrews 4, 14, uh, we got this. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted, as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How many of you would agree that's a good portion of scripture? Amen, you guys agree? That's some good stuff, good stuff. Matter of fact, we could spend the rest of the series, we could, we could spend all month just talking about those verses, trying to harvest out the riches found there and we would still come up short. That's, that's how much good stuff is just in those verses. But for the sake of time, I really want to hone in on verse 15. I see that verse 15 is really good. And it's surrounded by uh, a couple supporting verses. We just read them. 14 and 16 support and point to verse 15. That's, that's the way that these operate. And in case you missed it, verse 14 and 16 give us the imperatives the things we're supposed to be doing, the, the, the let us statements. Do you see it there? Verse 14 says, let us hold fast to our confession, right? Our confession of faith in Jesus Christ, that we believe in him, that we're walking with him. That's our confession, okay? That's 14. Verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. In other words, when we're struggling, we got to go to Jesus. We got to ask for his grace. Let, let, we got to make sure, let us do those things. You guys would agree with me, I'm sure, both of those are very important for the lives of believers. Hold fast to our confession. Go to Jesus for grace. If we're not doing that stuff, we're probably not walking out our, our faith in Christ very effectively at all. In order for us to live in those and do those two things, we have to grasp verse 15. That's what they're pointing to. Verse 15, it's critical. If we diminish it, skip over it, downplay it, then we're not going to be able to do 14 and 16 well. Okay, let's, let's read it one more time. Verse 15, we don't have a high priest 
who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Okay, we got to wrestle with this. We got to we got to know what this means if we're going to do the other things. And the Holy Spirit inspired the writer of this New Testament book to put this in there. This is very intentional by the heart of God to make sure we, we, we get this, we understand this verse. And, and I think if you really want to kind of boil it down, put it, put it in other words, at least this is the way that I see this, um, it's an understanding that we would know Jesus isn't just for us, but Jesus is with us. That's what I see right there. He's not just for us. He's not, Jesus isn't just lobbing down pep talks from heaven trying to get us to be better. Okay, that's, he's not just for us. Jesus is with us. God with us. That sounds Christmassy, doesn't it? Like, you know what I said? I'm like, that's Emmanuel. You guys know that? That's what it means. Emmanuel, God with us. We, you know, all through Christmas time, we're singing songs about it. We're doing stuff. Emmanuel, and that's wonderful. We need to grasp this idea, this central point of the incarnation that God left heaven and came to earth to be to be with us physically that is that's really really important stuff but it's more than that it's more than just a physical incarnation it's more than that if you look at hebrews 4 15 you also see that that we need to understand and and personalize this this solidarity that christ has with us in our in our weakness how many guys feel weak sometimes yeah, some of you are like, man, when that alarm clock went off this morning, I felt weak. What happened? You know, like, it's like getting hit with a sledgehammer. Like, that one hour can mess you up, you know? And so I just, I just look forward to fall. Like, every time this happens, I'm like, the fall's coming. And then we get to fall back, and it's beautiful. You get the extra hour then. But anyway, he's with us in our, in our weakness. He's with us in our, in our pain. Come on, sometimes life is full of pain. Anybody else who tells you different? Is trying to sell you something. <laughs> That's just a quote, and it's from a great movie I'll talk about later. But anyway, he's with us in our suffering. He's with us in our, our lowliness. He's with us in our temptation. You realize that? That's a really, a matter of fact, that's the one that was alluded to right there. He's able to sympathize with us in our weakness. One who in every respect has been tempted, specifically wanted to reference that, tempted as we are. So in all of that, he sympathizes with us. That word there that we have, sympathize, in the Greek, it's sympatheo. I had to look that up and listen to it online so I could figure out how they say it. You know, and that's the way they, and that's it. And it's taking two Greek words together, with and to suffer. You put that together and you have this word, sympatheo. Well, we translate as to sympathize. So again, it's not just for us. God doesn't have this cold, detached pity as he looks down on humanity like, oh, it must be horrible to be them, you know, or like he's, again, lobbing down pep talks, that idea. That is not it. He is with us in our weakness, our pain, in our suffering. So a way to look at it would say, all right, our pain is his pain. Our suffering is his suffering, right? It's, it, they are connected. He wants us to see that. And Because of that, we need to understand his love for us. It cannot be held back when we are in need. We're his children. Because he is with us in that suffering, his love extends to us every single time without fail. Not only that, but we should also think about the implications of what it means when it says, Jesus, uh, one who in every, church say every, every respect, has been tempted as we are. Uh, and I shared in our Bible study how I tend to want to push back on that one. I don't like it. I told him, like, I just don't like it. Every time I read the verse, like my first just knee-jerk reaction, that's like, I just, I don't like the way it's worded. I don't like the idea. I just feel like at first glance that it diminishes the holy divinity of God that he would be tempted by anything. I mean, like, he's the son of God. This is Jesus, right? He's got, he certainly has to be above all of this temptation as one that is greater and one that is higher. I mean, no temptation of this world should, should even register on his radar right you know like this is the way that I just naturally want to think about Jesus Um, but that's not true right understand that I'm not saying that that's right that's just my knee-jerk thought of Jesus as I think about him higher the truth is found in God's word 
And the word right here says in every respect, he has been tempted as we are. And that actually should bring us tremendous comfort and hope because, you know, that means that Jesus, again, he's not just for us, but he's, he's with us. Now, your, your translation, by the way, it might look a little different. Your translation might say that he was tested uh, in every re- respect. That's also good, okay? It's, that doesn't change the idea here at all because to be, to be tested still implies a struggle. It still implies a, a battle to honor God. That's all still there uh, within that word. So either, either is a beautiful translation, but the most impacting part, do you see the last three words there? Right, in every way, tempted as we are, all that. What are the last three words? Yet without sin. That's amazing. Come on, how many guys would agree? We, come on, we gloss over that, don't we? We're like, oh yeah, he's Jesus. Yeah, without our sin, sinless sacrifice on the cross, died on the cross. You know, like we put all the attention over there and that's, one, that's wonderful. It's wonderful to think of Jesus dying on the cross and raising again, uh, again. But just for a second, think about the fact that he had to live his whole life and never give in to sin, not even once. Think about how difficult that must have been. Just blows my mind. I mean, sometimes I I have a hard time making it through one day, right? You know what I'm saying? Like even just a day, imagine an entire life and never once sinning. So why are we talking about this? Why? Like, why is this important? This is what I see here. All right, so it's very natural for us to think that when we are, when we're living right and everything's going well and life is good and all this stuff, we look at that and we're like, all right, so God loves me and God is, is with me and God is blessing me and is pleased with me and all the things because I'm doing what I should be doing and everything's all good. That's easy to think that way. We all probably think that way. That is not a stretch to jump to that place. But if you look at Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 and you study it and you look at it and you read it, you're going to see that the opposite is actually also true. That it's not just about when you feel like the perfect version of yourself, but God also loves you and is with you and sympathizes with you and understands you and all this stuff in your brokenness. That's the whole point of the verse, that God wants us to understand is is true. Now, I want to give you a quote from Ortland's book because per usual he does a way better job than than I do at describing this. So let's just let me read let me read the quote. He says, "Consider your own life. When the relationship goes sour, when the feelings of futility come flooding in, when it feels like life is passing us by, when it seems like our one shot at significance has slipped through our fingers, when we can't sort out our emotions, when a longtime friend lets us down, when a family member betrays us, when we feel deeply misunderstood, when we're laughed at by the impressive. In short, when the fallenness of the world closes in on us and makes us want to throw in the towel, there, right there, we have a friend who knows exactly what such testing feels like and sits close to us, embraces us, he's with us. Our tendency is to feel intuitively that the more difficult life gets, the more alone we are. As we sink further into pain, we sink further into felt isolation. Well, the Bible corrects us. Our pain never outstrips what he himself shares in. We are never alone. That sorrow that feels so isolating, so unique, was endured by him in the past and is now shouldered by him in the present. That's good stuff. <laughs> that's, a, that's a real good word. Makes me think about that whole, take my yoke upon you. It's my burden is easy and light, right? That yoke that rests on the shoulders. He's saying, look, Jesus says, just come to me. I'll take all of that brokenness, all of that weight. I'll put it on my shoulders. I'll shoulder it for you. Um, I love it. So when we're weak, he's there, right? When we're tempted, he, he's there. We're not abandoned. He knows what we're going through. He understands. He sympathizes with our weakness. And if if we hold to our confession of faith, if we boldly approach that throne of grace, if we keep doing the two things that we're supposed to be doing and understanding why we can do them, 
Oh, that's a beautiful place. How many guys are thankful for that? You're thankful we can keep doing that. Praise God. Let's keep moving. Um, even as we talk about how much Christ can relate to us, then that to me brings a little bit of attention to the last part of verse uh, 15 there because we have this huge glaring area that Jesus can't relate to us in. Right? What is it? Right? It just said, uh, yet without sin. Okay, so Jesus can't relate to that part of us, not, not fully, because he was completely without, uh, without sin in every single way. And far too often, uh, we give in to sin, far, far more than probably what we would want anybody to ever know. Like we say sometimes, if we put it up on the screen, right, we'd all like crawl under our chairs because we know we're, we're sinful people, we're imperfect people. Even at our best, we still, we still manage to mess things up and and then what happens? Then we have to deal with the shame that you know, follows those moments, sometimes the consequences that follow those moments, uh, all of that. That's tied to our, to our sin, but not Jesus. He didn't, he didn't deal with that, and that he can't relate to us uh, the same way. And it then can be easy for us to look at that and almost, as weird as it sounds, almost view that as a bit of a, as a negative and what I mean by that is it can be tempting to think of our struggle with sin and then all of that guilt and then just think that Jesus, well, he can't help with that. Why? Because, you know, he, he just doesn't get it. He never sinned, so he doesn't get that shame. He doesn't get that guilt. He never felt those kind of things. And so then that means I'm alone in my failure. I'm just isolated in this, this guilt. Jesus hasn't been here. He hasn't felt here, so he can't help here. And that's a lie. Okay, understand, that whole thought process right there, that is a lie that the enemy would want to use to keep us from, verse 16, boldly approaching the throne of grace. And the enemy never stops trying to lie to us, does he? <laughs> He's always trying to lie about something. It's just what he does. And so I was thinking about this, about how our hope has to have been placed in a savior who did not sin. If it was anything else, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have any power, right? I mean, if, if Jesus sinned, the whole thing falls apart. It has to have been in Christ who is absolutely sinless because when we fall into our sin, we have to have someone on solid footing, someone who's absolutely pure and holy that can reach in and get us out, right? That's, that's the only way it works. And so I got to thinking about a movie. Who's seen The Princess Bride? Let me ask this. Who's, let me see your hands. I just got to know. Who are my people out there? Oh, Oh, that's a good movie. Come on now. There's more quotables in that one movie than probably any other movie. And I thought about starting to run through some of them, but then I realized I'd just spend the whole rest of the morning just saying movie quotes from The Princess Bride, and that's not going to help anybody. And so I'm not even going to go down that road. But man, it's such a good movie. If you haven't seen it, that's your homework today. Go find it on a streaming platform and watch The Princess Bride because it's just, it's wonderful. But anyhow, uh, I was thinking about this movie, and there's a moment where Wesley, who's the main character, used to be the farm boy, now he's the Dread Pirate Roberts. Is that his name, Roberts? I think that's right. So anyway, he's, he's uh, there with uh, Princess Buttercup. <laughs> that's right, Princess Buttercup, you know, like that whole moment. And so you got her, and they're walking through the fire swamp, which sounds awesome, right? Because you got the rodents of unusual size and the fire, you know, and that comes up. And also the quicksand, which I think they call lightning sand. And so they're going through and they're walking, and all of a sudden, you remember the scene, right? Princess Buttercup is there one second, and then she's like, whoosh, gone. Like, she just disappears straight into the sand. And so what does Wesley do? What does he do? He's like, oh, he freaks out for a second. I got what? Grabs a vine, you know, cuts it with his sword, wraps it around his arm, and then he dives in head first into the sand, in the quicksand. He just goes in. And then, in perfect, cinematic, suspenseful way, the scene just like is quiet for like a solid 10 seconds. Do you remember this scene you know I'm talking about? Like 10 seconds. The little R-O-U-S comes walking around, you know, and then it, it, it disappears. And eventually Wesley's hand comes shooting back through the sand. You know, he's climbing up, you know, on the, on the vine. He's got Princess Buttercup in tote, you know, like the whole thing. Some of you are looking at me like, this sounds like a lame movie. <laughs> okay, if you haven't seen it, don't judge me, okay? It's good stuff. It's good stuff. But anyway, uh, the scene happens. And so I'm thinking about this scene, and I'm like, 
this is a good parallel to Jesus. <laughs> you know, I'm a pastor when I'm seeing parallels and things like this, but yeah, I am. So I'm like, it's Jesus, Wesley, the farm boys, Jesus, you know, and so I'm, yeah. So this is what, here's how I see it. If we just had a savior who stumbled into sin with us, in other words, if Wesley and the princess both fell in the, into the sand at the same time, what good's that gonna do anybody, okay? That's not helping anything. What the princess needed was for Wesley to be on solid footing, to grab the vine and to jump in after her. And what we need as a savior is sometimes, as easy as it is to think that Jesus can't relate to me because he doesn't know sin and view that negatively, we need to understand it is such a positive thing because that means Jesus was in a place that he could dive head first into our brokenness, feel the, the suffocation of, of, of pain, of this world, of, of temptation, press the darkness of temptation all around him. Like he was inundated with all these things, but because he was without sin, he's the only one that could pull us back up out of that and bring us to a place of, of safety. And we need to be thankful for that. Amen? Amen. Not only that, but we should also understand um, that Jesus, I believe he, he dealt with temptation at a level that we will never understand. Okay, never understand. And I know uh, some of you also might not agree with that because it's like, well, I mean, I believe Jesus might have dealt with temptation, but it, I mean, I'm not even quite sure of that, but I'm sure it was a low level because he is the son of God after all. I mean, he probably had a leg up on the whole temptation thing. But again, we don't see that in scripture. It's not there. So if you actually just look at the word of God, um, you see some opposite things. Do you know Jesus? Um, he went out into the wilderness and Satan himself, like face to face, dealt with him and tempted him in the wilderness. That's intense. If you really let that sink in. Anybody ever had Satan tempt you face to face for a while? It's your greatest moment of weakness. He's out there fasting for 40 days, no food. Most of us just die, right? He's out there and, and that's when Satan chooses. Ever notice how Satan attacks you when you're weak? Come on, there's a whole sermon right in there. But nonetheless... Jesus had to deal with that level of temptation is Satan's probing for any level of weakness in Christ, anything at all that he can exploit. But Jesus uses the word of God at every turn and defeats him. It's a powerful, powerful point in scripture. But not just that, I think that, I think that Jesus deals with, or dealt with, I should say, dealt with temptation at a higher level than what we ever will because he never gave up. Think about this. He never gave in, uh, not even once. The way that the book described it, and he was actually quoting, I believe, C.S. Lewis at the time, uh, where, where C.S. Lewis was talking about how when we, imagine yourself like pushing against a wind, right? This wind is just blowing, it's fierce wind, um, and you're pushing against it moment after moment, step after step against this wind, eventually, right, you, because of lack of strength, you just can't, you just can't keep going anymore. And so you, you lay down and that wind just blows over you. There's just nothing you can do, right? And that, and that, but then he said, but Jesus, that's not the way it worked with Jesus because Jesus never laid down, right? He continued on in the battle against temptation beyond what any other human being ever has because every other human being has sinned and laid down so they don't know what that next step would have been like. Does that make sense? Okay. So we need to understand Jesus dealt with temptation in ways that we'll probably never, never fully understand. And that is, again, something that we should take hope in. We should find joy in that, to know in our moments of temptation, Jesus understands. He sympathizes with our weakness. He knows what that temptation is like and he's willing to meet us in the midst of it because he never gave up, right? Not, not even one time. He never had those compromising thought processes that he, that he uh, gave into. You know, the whole, oh man, just, just this once. You know, and nobody's gonna know, you know, and, or whatever. Like, I'll ask for forgiveness later. It'll be okay. Like all those things, all the rationalizations that we can tend to use. Jesus never let those win out. He always remained, he remained, he remained true to God every day. And that's so amazing. Um, and so then we have that statement, for, for we don't have a high priest 
who's unable to sympathize with our weakness, one who in every respect, he's been tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. And then it moves on. Now keep on reading here. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy, we may find grace to help in times of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. All right. So we're going to talk about this for for a few more minutes, then we're going to wrap up, okay? Because there's some power here as well uh, that that we should understand. Now, those couple sentences, it can be easy to fly past, okay? Because right when we read it, it can be easy to be like, all right, so they're talking about Jesus here for a minute, but then we just got into, they're just talking about the high priest generic, just the office of the high priest. They can offer gifts and sacrifices and and so on. And so you almost kind of blow past it, and then we'll get back to the good stuff. But if you do that, you're missing it, okay? Because when we read about Old Testament laws, Old Testament systems, Old Testament things. What we need to do is understand Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament Jewish law and religion, okay? Jesus fulfilled it all. That's why in the end, after he died, he was like, it is finished. It's completed. It's all been done. And so when you see things talking about the the Jewish system and, and religion, what we should always do is like, okay, so where is Jesus in that? Where do we find Jesus if he's the fulfillment of it? And in this place, we've already been told, understand Jesus is the ultimate high priest, right? We already covered that part. That was verses earlier. So we we can understand right now as they're talking about a high priest, we should see Jesus in that. So when it says the high priest offers sacrifices for sins, we need to understand something here, okay? So, So the high priest, physical high priest back in the day, what would they do? They would... They would uh, they do animal sacrifices, right? That was that was the system. Bring the animal, sacrifice the animal, do the do the ritual and the thing, and that was that was what they were told to do in the Jewish law, and so they would do it, and that's fine. But Jesus, what did Jesus do? What's the sacrifice that he brought? What did he do? He didn't he didn't go get an animal from the pasture, did he? No, because he wasn't trying to participate with the system. He was trying to complete the system. And so he didn't go grab an animal or a lamb. He said, I am the lamb. I am the perfect one. So he brought himself to the altar of sacrifice, right? And he hung himself on on the cross and shed his own blood. It was not about a substitution anymore, about what some animal could do to, to cover over a sin for a moment. Jesus said, I, once and for all, am defeating sin. And so that's what took place in that moment when it says he offers sacrifices Jesus has done it in in himself. And then verse 2, in light of that, in light of that sacrifice, verse 2, how does he deal with us? Think about it. How does he deal with it? In, In his love for us, if his love for us was enough to cause him to lay down his own life, not just go get an animal, but he's going to do it himself. If that love for us is so much, how do you think his heart responds to the needy, broken individual that comes to him. How do you, I mean, how do you think? Verse 2 says, he can deal, what's the word? Gently with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. So we already talked about the weakness part. We covered that. He can sympathize with our weakness in every way. So we're not going to go back to that. But it says he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward. Uh, let's hone in on that for just a couple minutes, okay? Because these are, this is very intentional. Um, I can feel ignorant and wayward sometimes just by the very nature of life. I can feel like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. Where, what's the next step supposed to be? Where am I supposed to go? Hell, anybody know what I'm talking about? Do you ever feel that way? Yeah, four of you, eight, nine, 12, okay, 15. The rest, everybody else, you know your path and you're good with it. I sometimes feel ignorant and I feel wayward and that's, you know, I live some of my time there. But then, but then I'm reading this, I'm like, is that really, is that really what he's talking about there? I do think Jesus helps us in that, but this is a little bit more intentional. When it says that he deals gently with the ignorant, well, let's talk about that one first. 
the ignorant. This is more than just moments of confusion in our life. The ignorant represents the, the myriad of moments that we fall short and we don't even recognize it. Do you realize you're doing that? Yeah? You guys still awake out there? Did you fall asleep on me? I feel like some of you did. You did. I see that. Anybody else? <laughs> right, is everybody awake? Good. I've told you, you're not allowed to fall asleep. It really does hurt my feelings. Are you awake? Uh, we got another one. Okay. <laughs> Wake her up. Um, anyway, uh, so ignorant. We have a myriad of moments that we fall short and we don't even realize we're doing it. Why? Because we are inundated and surrounded in a sinful world. Nothing we can do about it, okay? It's just where we are. It's the status of life. It's where we are. So I think that it's impossible then to understand all the ways that sin impacts and touches our life. We just, we don't even get it. But God is completely perfect and holy in every way. And sin is sin to God. So here's what we can tend to do. Here's, here, here's what we do. We will get fixated on the handful of sins that we really know that we struggle with, right? Because they're the ones that, that beep you know, really loud on our radar and like lighting up like, okay, so I really got to focus on this sin and that sin because I know I'm struggling with that. And we know if we don't deal with them, then Satan's just going to keep on pressing that button over and over. So we put our attention there and we're like, Lord, I need your help with this. I need forgiveness and give me strength and, and all this. But what about all of the other things that are going in our life where we are affected in our actions and in our thoughts and in our motivations and we're sinning and we don't even, like, we don't even know about it, but we're not measuring up to the perfection of God's holiness. What about all of that? I mean, if we're expected to identify, repent, and move on from things that we don't even know about, how many you know we're in a world of hurt? That's not going to work. Like it all falls apart because we can't, we can't maintain that. That just sounds exhausting even thinking about it. That's why this verse is pretty important. Don't you think? Because it says what? Jesus can deal gently uh, with, with the ignorant. Even when we don't even know, Jesus is like, I'm there. I'm with you in that. I got that. I got that covered. You're okay. That's powerful stuff. And then what's the next category? The wayward. The wayward. This one hits a little bit harder because it's not near as innocent. We can't feel hands off with this one as much because the wayward implies that you, that you know the path, right? You've been on the path. But for one reason or another, you've chosen to take a step off the path um, to do your own thing. You know, you, you, you justify the moment, you figured the, the, the want was worth the wander off the path and so you did it and then there you are. And uh, we all know what it is to be wayward because we've all been there. Every single person in this room knows what it is to have willful sin and to make a choice that you knew God didn't want you to do, but you did it anyway. So we're all in that together. Um, and, and God says, you know what, even in that, I see you and I, I, know, what, I know what it is to, to uh, have weakness in this life. Though I never sinned, I know what it is to be surrounded by it. And he has mercy and grace even, uh, even for that. And here's what I know about those moments of willful sin. They become like a, like a playground for the enemy, don't they? He loves it. He loves it because what he can do is he can usher in shame and guilt and condemnation and he can have fun there all day long in those moments because he knows we made the choice to do it. We kicked the door open and we welcomed it in and he's like, all right, let's go. And he just, he just plays in that place as long as we allow him to. But Jesus said, I will deal gently even with the wayward, even with you who know the path and choose to take a step off. I'm not going to beat you up for it. Not going to spite you from heaven. I'll deal gently with you if you come to me. So when we fall short, guys, we don't have to wallow in our brokenness because we have a God who, who, who sympathizes with that weakness um, and he knows temptation. And just because he never gave into it doesn't mean he doesn't understand the struggle. And so I would say this, in a room this size, and we're wrapping up on this thought, in a room this size, um, I'm pretty certain that there's dozens that are dealing with the fallout, even in this moment, dealing with the fallout of being uh, wayward. You've made a decision at some point in time, uh, maybe in the past month, maybe in the past week, perhaps for you in the past morning, like you didn't make it like through Sunday morning. 
you made a choice that was that just wasn't it wasn't right it wasn't godly you you knew it was a sin you did it anyway like you're you, that's this is where you're at right now you're in a wayward moment and so now you have sat through an entire morning <laughs> with a certain level of discomfort in your spirit because you know something's wrong. Like you know it. You, you know it's not right. It, you feel it. Like in your spirit, you feel it. And what the enemy does is he wants to turn that into shame and into guilt, and as we said, into condemnation. All of those things in an effort to steal, kill, and destroy your faith. This is where he operates, okay? It's what he does. And so he's going to do that uh, for you. But listen, the Holy Spirit is different. It's a beautiful thing, okay? The Holy Spirit operates differently. Uh, that feeling of discomfort that you can have in your spirit is not meant to shame you. It's meant to draw you. Very, very important distinction there. It's a beautiful, priceless gift known as uh, conviction. You guys ever heard of that one before? It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. Let me ask you this. How many of you... Uh, have a, a, a fire alarm uh, in some regard mounted in your home. You have a fire alarm on those things. Okay, most of you. If you didn't raise your hand, please go buy one today. I'm, 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 like, I'm scared for you all of a sudden. I realize that was dangerous to ask from the stage because now I've like, got to track you down afterwards. Uh, yeah, go buy one. But anyway, you should have one. I have m you know, multiple. We have multiple in the house. Okay, follow-up question. How many of you love the sound of the fire alarm? Like you find yourself just in the afternoon sometimes, you're just pressing the button so you can listen to it. Like you just love it. You're like, I love that. I love that sound, you know. How many of you love that sound of that stupid, oh, I shouldn't say that because I'm leading you in the question. How many of you love the sound of the chirp it makes when the battery dies? That little, I, mean, I can't even mimic it. Like it's just there, but you're like, where the heck did that come from? Like I know, like it's somewhere. You know where it is, but you don't know where it's coming from. You know that. Super annoying, right? So anyway, I'm thinking about this, and I'm like, all right, none of us love the sound of the fire alarm, but you still own them, don't you? Matter of fact, if that fire alarm uh, like goes out or breaks or something happens, you're going to go to the store, and you're going to buy another one. Even though you hate the sound of it, you're going to go get another one and take the time to install the thing. If the battery dies, you're going to go and hunt down a fresh battery and put the thing in there, even though you don't even like the sound of it. Why are you going to do that, okay? You're going to do that because you understand the fire alarm has a very important purpose, and it's beyond just its ability to save your possessions if there's a fire. You understand it has the ability to save your life, right? The life of your kids, the life of your family. Like, there's a lot riding on that little piece of plastic hanging on your ceiling. And so you're looking at it like, I got to, you know, we have them. So I would say this. Here's a nice little tie-in. Conviction is your Holy Spirit's fire alarm. Okay, Think about it that way. That's what conviction is for you and the value that it, that it has. If you this morning are hearing that annoying little chirp somewhere, you're like, where is that coming from in my spirit? You don't even quite know yet, but you hear something. Or maybe for you it's going off full blast. You know, like right now you're like, oh my goodness, I got to do something. Okay. Don't just roll over and go back to sleep. Hello? Wake up. Do something about it. God is trying to get your attention. That is the alarm, the conviction, is the alarm in your spirit to take action. The enemy, he's trying to muffle that thing. He's like, get, the, you know, get a towel up there. Hold, you know, he's like, he doesn't want the sound to go off. And if it does, he wants us to think God is shaming us, but he's not. He's loving you. The beautiful reality of conviction is it's an action of love to draw you. And this morning, as we come to the end of our gathering, we have a moment to respond to that call of love. So why don't we stand to our feet and do just that? Would you please bow your, your head? And if you would, even close your eyes. Just stand in silence for a moment. Would you do your best to think about some things today that you've heard and sung and felt? Just let that begin to, to run in your mind and your spirit. Lord, 
we come to you right now. And we're trying to respond to you. We're making space for that. Even in the silence. Uh, It's just saying, speak to us. Because, Lord, we know that you are real. And you love us and you pursue us and you are with us. So, Lord, in this, in this moment, I, I just ask that you would do a work that nobody else can do. Uh, if there's anybody else who could have done it, you would have, you would have gladly allowed that to happen. You, did, you even said, let, let the cup pass me by. I don't, I don't want to have to go to the cross. But uh, in the end, you, you did. And you did it out of love for us. You paid the price. You purchased grace to be offered freely. And so in this moment, uh, you could say, come to me. All who are weary, heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. So Lord, that's what we want to respond to right now. With every head bowed and every eyes closed, I'm, I'm asking across the room. If you're hearing that chirp in your spirit and or maybe that alarm's going off and you're just saying, ah, I, I, I'm wayward, I'm not where I need to be. Maybe you've never even been on the path, but you you want to. You're ready to step off of your own path. You're tired of doing it your own way. And you're saying, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord, the leader of my life from this day forward. I don't don't want to do it my own way anymore. I want your way. If that's you, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to slip a hand up. And I do this so I can see you and I can pray over you from here. I'm not going to pull you forward, but I I do want to see you. So on the count of three, lift that hand. One, two, three. I see you. Let me, let me see your eyes. Yeah. I see you guys. I see you. Any others? If I haven't made eye, eye contact with you, just lift your hand up again. Yeah, I see you. Praise God. Lord, hands raised around the room right now. Matter of fact, whether you raised your hand for the first time or, or not, um, even if... You've known the Lord for a lot of years. Why don't we just speak a prayer? Let's place, place these words upon our lips. If you'd repeat after me. Jesus, I come to you right now. I confess that I'm a sinner. But I also confess that you're Lord. You died on the cross for me. You rose from the grave for me. I receive your love and grace. Now help me, Jesus, to live for you every day. And Lord, we do pray that in the name of Jesus and believe that you have heard the prayer and that you are acting upon it. Even now, you are making our our, our sins be, be washed away from our soul, our spirit, our life, and you're making us clean, as white as the snow. You're the only one that can do it, Lord, and we thank you for your grace. We have boldly approached your throne today and we've asked for your grace and you've given it you've given it freely and with love and gently thank you Jesus I pray as we walk out of these doors today that we would go in your victory that every time the enemy comes prowling around we would see him coming and we would cast him out Lord that he would have no place in our heart in our actions in our life Lord we know that you're going to give us that ability this week And we thank you for it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, thanks for being here. I look forward to seeing you back next week. God bless. Oh, yeah, we got a missions trip meeting over here in a few minutes. If you're on the missions team, please don't forget.